great, great pleasure to have uh, Ted back here, handling a game, and um, sadly, they're soon to depart from the States on a more permanent basis, largely thanks to the present incumbent of the White House, ruining the economy. Bush dollars don't go far away. Bush dollars. I was saying earlier that um, it's very auspicious, I think, to be here on Super Tuesday, so <laughs> fingers crossed. And um, Ted needs very little introduction. I think the reason why people are here is because they know about the work, and it's particularly good to see people from the fourth form kind of work who hear about the work. Over to you, Ted. Okay, well, first of all, I'm not going to talk about technology because I hate the word, <clears throat> and it's a myth. Technology. If you're talking about Macintosh technology or the web technology, it ain't technology. It's packaging. Packaging and conventions. And so most of what's out there is packaging and conventions. And I believe I'm the only actual dissenter in the computer field. Everybody else accepts 90% of what's out there. And I say it's time to start over because today's computer world is the result of techie misunderstandings of human life and human thought. Marlene has a wonderful uncle, his name actually is Uncle Sam, <coughs> and we showed him the web, and he went out and bought a Windows machine, and two weeks later he took it back. This is a very intelligent guy, he once was an assistant to a US senator, a very intelligent US senator, and, uh, but at the age of 80 he could not handle all the folders and naming and crud that you don't realize you've had to learn, that you shouldn't have to learn because it's not relevant to most of the things we want to do. And my particular concern is documents, by which I mean paper documents and electronic documents. And I believe that today's electronic documents are appalling. Microsoft Word and Adobe Acrobat are the lowest common denominator of what human thought actually needs. And the World Wide Web isn't much better. So I thought I'd talk a little about my own high school experience <laughs> and how it <how> contributed <clears throat> to where I went after it. Because right now, you are much more of your adult self than you could possibly imagine. And things in you will unfold, perhaps to your detriment and perhaps to your great benefit, that are your inner nature, your inner concerns, your subconscious, whatever. And uh, then they will rattle against the outside world and what will happen with that. In my case, I was a movie obsessed kid and a literary kid. I loved to read. I hated school because it interfered with my reading. And uh, but I was pretty well read. By the age of 10, I could have told you who had coined the words tintinabulate and, uh, and uh, uh, chortle. And, uh, uh, okay. Uh, serendipity. <laughs> but movies were my great love. They, to me, the movie theater was a church, cathedral, where I had my greatest emotional experiences. And I was, I remember when Fantasia first opened, when Bambi first opened, I saw the first run in the early 40s. And uh, we lived in a part of New York City. My grandparents raised me, and we lived in a large, quiet apartment on Washington Square. And I remember when I was 10, we had a screwy school, not too much, kind of like this one. And there was a course on opera for 15 minutes before lunch on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And Mr. Bessinger made us memorize the plots of various operas. And we got to La Boheme, and I asked, what is a Bohemian? And he said, look it up. So I read Albert Parry's History of Bohemianism in America. And I said, wow, this Greenwich Village sounds like a fabulous place. I wonder where it is not knowing that I lived at ground zero. Uh, partly because the Greenwich Village of Song and Story was, was a rattletrap uh, walk-ups 
and uh, not of the fancy apartment building where we lived, lived or the one across the di diagonally across the corner where Mrs. Roosevelt lived. I remember once when I, we got out of a taxi cab and Mrs. Roosevelt got in and said, oh, little boy, you forgot your comic book. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so this was, so I lived in a world of media and when I was about 15, I learned to write. Well, what I mean, I don't, I don't you know, learn to make characters on paper, but rather there were big papers assigned to us and unfortunately I had a tendency to make them bigger. So I was writing 50 page papers and reorganizing them constantly. And I don't remember where I heard this motto first, possibly from my father. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was born, so they would visit me occasionally independently. And um, I believe he said, writing is mostly rewriting. And what is rewriting? It's mostly rearrangement. And so we had a process. May I use this? May I cut this up? Of course. I guess. I was taught a process called cut and paste. And in the process of cut and paste, you would take what you'd written, look at it, and say, well, maybe it should begin here. So you put this at the beginning, and then you say, no, wait a minute, this, this maybe should go in here. And now, well, that's not bad. No, this should be the beginning. And we'll get rid of this one. So now, you paste these together. That was cut and paste. If you're looking at all the pieces at the same time and considering their rearrangement, and to me, the greatest <coughs> outrage of the computer field is the barbaric change of those names in 1984. When they made the word cut mean hide this, and the word uh, paint mean plug it in where I'm pointing. Because we lost the process of deep rearrangement, which is so central to creative work. Yeah, my grandmother told me a story, and I didn't realize what it meant until years later. She had gone to hear a lecture by one of Tolstoy's daughters, Tolstoy the great Russian novelist. And he had, uh, he had a huge uh, building, a dacha, a, 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 an estate called Yasnaya Poliana. <clears throat> and he would dictate, he would read the old draft and dictate to his daughters. One daughter, two, two daughters would both copy it out by hand as he talked. And then he would do this, he would cut it up all over the floor. So the whole novel practically is in sections being rearranged. And he would go for long walks in the woods and call back from the edge of the forest, don't touch my noodles. <laughs> and that story resonated with me. And only years later did I realize it was the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> so one copy was being kept for reference. One copy was being rearranged. Now, they changed the meanings of those words to hide and plug or cram and vomit, you know, control C and control V. And, and it has nothing to do with the deep process of rearrangement, which mankind has lost because they change the meaning of the word. If you, Orwell said that if you change the meaning of words, people will forget. And what year did they bring out the Macintosh? 1984. And that is the year, that Orwellian year, is when we forgot how to rearrange it because so few of the customers knew about this process. It was then imposed on, and, and what do they say? They said, oh, this is what you have to learn because this is the real, this is the technological way to do it. Oh, yeah. Or the other is, um, this is what cut and paste really meant. And you didn't know it. You <laughs> thought you were looking at all those pieces at the same time, but really, this is the same thing. Ah! But you see, this is the sort of thing that techies believe. They can convince themselves of anything. I heard of a, a, an architect I heard him speak once, Len, uh, Juan Gorman, said, uh, intellectuals have an enormous capacity for believing in nonsense. And so, to me, the cut and paste betrayal represents the evils of today's computer world. But that's the pinnacle of it because it means that we don't have any decent writing tools. We don't have any decent writing tools. You can only look at the part you're, 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 you're working on. You cannot see the whole thing, and you cannot cut a thing up and rearrange it. Now, there, there exist a few 
isolated packages that allow this, but I've never seen any. Uh, and, uh, and so, as far as I'm concerned, it, it's basically not available. So this was, this was <coughs> my background. I, I'd written, by the time I got to college, and by the time I was through with college, I, I'd written a lot of very long papers by this method. It was very familiar with it. And I felt that paper was a prison, or was, right? And the ideas are always trying to wriggle free. So when you put something in parentheses, that means here's an idea that would like to escape. When you have a footnote, here's an idea that would like to escape to something else, but there's no place for it to go. So it's just down at the bottom of the prison floor, or it's on the side. But if we had, if somehow there were a way to write, and I was already experimenting in high school. I, I remember putting posters on the wall with strings between them. And this was, this was sort of the first link of this kind. Then when I was just about to graduate from college, I made a movie. What happened was my roommate and I had gotten a grant of $700 to make a movie. It was a lot of money to get from the student council. And he suddenly died. And so, you know, besides losing my best friend, I thought, well, I'll see another project. And suddenly, just before exams, I said, wait a minute. He would have wanted me to go on. So I did. And I didn't have time to write a script. So I just, I did something that, that audiences are divided on. I had the actors say, park, park, like Huckleberry Hunt, you know, to sort of, uh, the idea will fit a long sentence to it, and it'll look stupid, but what the hell. And you know, like a comedy. <clears throat> and uh, it worked very well. And the, the atmosphere and the acting were very good. And I decided that that was my main talent. I was a filmmaker. But I knew how Hollywood worked. My mother was in films. My father was on in television. And um, basically, there was all this crap about having to raise money and get, get the project green-lighted and go through committees. Everything got watered down. Everything got spoiled by the decision. <coughs> the decision processes through which movies are made. And that's why it is so rare for really good films to be made. And I said, no, I'm either going to make money on my own. I'll, I'll just make very small films on my own with my own funds or make a lot of money. And, so then I, then I went to graduate school and I took a computer course. And I said, wait a minute, these guys don't know what they've got. This was 1960. 1960, when the only machines were big IBM computers and air conditioning rooms with raised flooring, or they were mini computers made by digital equipment, uh, which were rumored to be in the back rooms of various engineering firms, or militarized computers, such as the one I wanted so much was called the ANUYK1, which, could, which was made narrow enough to be lowered through the hatch of a submarine. And it was very rugged, which you needed. <clears throat> so I was sure that personal computers were going to come. The personal computing would be a billion dollar industry, and I'm sure I'm the first person to put it. And basically, my job was to design the documents of the future, because if I didn't, the techies would screw it up. And that is exactly what has happened. Because it seemed to me that you want to be able to deal with multiple versions, you want to be able to deal with deep rearrangement, you want to be able to see how versions correspond to so you want to see the first version next to the other version. Each part, each to each. You want to have all the connections, you want to see the origins of quotations. You want to be able to jump to the origin of every quotation. And that came to me from about five different, I, I reached that conclusion from about five different threads, which I forgot the moment. And uh, so that basically laid out, to me, what the document of the future should be. And three years later, I came up with the word hypertext to describe it, which didn't catch on. That was 1963. It didn't catch on. I didn't hear it used by anyone else outside the group I was with until 1986. So for 23 years, nobody used it. But their hypertext was different from mine. Unfortunately, in 1967, I accepted an invitation from a former friend of mine, I say former, who invited me to Brown University to work on a project to, quote, see about trying out some of your crazy ideas, unquote. 
and uh, everything important was cut down, and it was the links were made one way instead of two way, and that structure of hypertext went on from that system which is called HMS to another system which is called France, which to another system which is called Intermedia, all at Brown University, to another system which was called, oh, our friend in Washington, anyway, um, to another system which was built for the CIA by uh, uh, Xerox Park called Note Cards, to HyperCard from Apple, and finally the World Wide Web, which all embrace this cut down model, this cut down model of documents. Now, if any of you has, have done web pages, it's like karaoke. Anybody can do it. And that's one of the reasons people enjoy it. But the problem is revising and maintaining it. The more pages you have become a nightmare. So as with many things, the techies give you something easy to start and push it into your lap, and suddenly you've got the problems of version management, of unification, etc., etc., all of which nothing was provided for, which was always in my design. So, I wanted to say a few words here about following your dream, and that is you have to decide how, how and whether you're going to compromise it. Are you going to buy somebody, buy somebody else's dream? That's great. <laughs> because you say, whoever's in charge gets to decide the dream. The reason I have never accepted backing is that if you have a backer, that's four hands on the steering wheel, and guess who wins? And that means the alternative is I have to work through volunteers, uh, or people who will accept my promises of money maybe sometime. As, uh, what's her name said, a streetcar named Desire, I've always depended upon the kindness of strangers. And, uh, but, in the long run, it was the only way I could do things. And finally, after numerous setbacks, we have the thing that I have been telling you about in an uncompromising form. I guess let's, let's find it. Let's try to project it. Sure. So, so, yeah. I'll play with this whilst we... Thanks for The popular method in the United States now is called the venture capitalist. Venture capitalist class was created in 1931. After the stock market crash of 1929, everyone needed someone to blame, rather than irrational exuberance and foolishness. So the people they blamed were the people who started companies with inadequate proof of their value. And so they set very high thresholds for proving the value of your assets when you start a company and raise money from the public. Now, in this country, you can still do that rather easily. You can actually start, set up a company and say, I'm going to do such and such. Are you with me? Put in money. And you look at the guy and say, well, he's a lunatic. Yes, I will, or whatever you say. But uh, in the States, it's illegal. So the venture capitalists are people who will fulfill all of these standards for you, provided you give them your arms, your legs, and your head. And, uh, and then they take your company and they do something with it. Now, a lot of people didn't do it this way. Google, for example, managed to succeed, because they were very clever lads, they managed to succeed totally before they went public and they were able to sell stock to the public without losing control. But the venture capitalist route, which, has been, which is so widely spoken of with such high praise within the uh, editorial nostalgia of the USA is not for anybody who cares about the result of what they're doing, but only for people who want to make a lot of money in a short time and get out fast, because that's what the, what, that's what the venture capitalists do. They want a four-year exit plan that gets them a doubling of their money, and, uh, and then you get something left over. So anyway, these, these are the issues when you're trying to do it. If there's something you deeply believe in, it's very, very hard to do it unless you get into somebody else's agenda. Uh, so the one, so the version I'm going to show you now, <coughs> the, the saddest part is we, we, we raised, or well, my colleagues raised five million bucks for the Xanadu project in, uh, in 1987, but they made sure I had no say in how it was done. 
and then they proceeded to waste all that money from 1987 to 1992. And the whole operation went down the tubes. You can read about it anywhere on the net. Because they blame me, even though nobody, because no one mentions that I was prohibited by contract from having a new set. So, uh, so these are the these are the vicissitudes. The version we're on now is something like the fifth version of the Xanadu project, but uh, uh, it's also the most beautiful, and we really like it, and we really wish we had a projector. Can you run the simulation? Yeah, well I can. We, we did, can we run the projector for another machine? Yeah. Oh, okay. Let's do that. Um, Harris, I think the problem is uh, the link for this particular now, may, <coughs> many of you may have heard of Xanadu. You may think it is a, uh, a fictitious country like Shangri-La or Toyland or Oz, but in fact, Xanadu is a real place in Inner Mongolia, which was the summer palace of the Emperor Kublai Khan. And that's how where Coleridge got it for his great poem, Kublai Khan. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we found it from the air. I don't know if we have that uh, the, that URL here. Yeah. Uh, but but you can actually look at it on Google Earth, and it's still a square with a smaller square inside. And it's very beautiful to look at. It's very inspirational. I chose the name because of the famous person from Porlock. Coleridge wrote that he was interrupted in, in writing the poem by a person from Porlock who bothered him for an hour, and by that time he thought and forgot the rest of the poem. And so, uh, so uh, I thought of Xanadu as the magical place of literary memory where nothing is forgotten. And he wishes. No. Okay. <laughs> we just came back to a weekend in Bradford. Um, the Bradford, you know, what's called the National Media Center in Bradford Museum, the National Media Museum, has one of the few functioning Cinerama screens left in the world. When I was your age, about 1952, Cinerama opened. It was going to revolutionize movies because it was this huge screen. And uh, at, actually, Bradford's screen is only as wide as this room, but, but it's still the original Cinderella show. So it begins with an announcer named Lowell Thomas, who is also an investor in the system, giving on, on a small screen, giving a giving a uh, history of movies, and you see bits of Great Train Robbery and this and that, and the original footage of that and that. And he says, "But now, this is Cinderella." And the curtains part and part and part and part and part. And you're on a roller coaster. Going up, 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 with stereo sound. We never heard stereo sound before in 1952. And this was seven speakers. Back, front, side, side. And, um, and it's just awesome. And, and even, even in, in its reduced state in Bradford, I deeply recommend that you get there. It's on Saturdays at 1, 1.30? First Saturday of the month. First Saturday of the month at one thirty. And, uh, There's also an IMAX theater in that same complex, and they've shown all kinds of IMAX 3D stuff. We saw Beowulf in IMAX 3D, which is as much of anything as you ever want to see. I was going to say, I've also brought, when we get up, I have also brought some discs for ZigZag to leave with you so that you can play with it. Zigzag being the uh, being the data system I worked on. I have only all my life's work is boiled down to two projects. My like computer work anyway, the uh, the Xanadu and the Zigzag structure. And Zigzag is a uh, is a data structure which is unlike any other, but it's extremely powerful. And those of you who know that it's wasn't attached to the other. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't get anything. Right. So um. How was it doing it by telepathy?
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
if we swarf into the, uh, if, if we go to this one, we see, you've all heard of Adam and Eve. <clears throat> Maybe some of you have heard of Adam and Lilith, because in a, in a variant reading of the Bible, Eve was the, uh, Lilith was the first woman and not Eve. So where does that come from? Well, it comes from a book called The Alphabet of Ben Sirah. I've just made this the primary document. Now we go back and make this the primary document. So that's all there is. Uh, oh yes, we have, the flints are, are, are gray, and these are links, but they're overlaid. So you can have as many links on top of each other as you like, and of course they're two-way, unlike the links of conventional hypertext and the World Wide Web. That's all there is. Just to add one thing, it can be audio, eventually you'll be able to put audio and video in as well as text. Okay, that's not all there is. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I was going to say that's all there is in this version. But the idea is that, you see, people accept what the techies have given them as the structure of the universe, in it, as constructs, okay? So the Thames River is the structure of the universe. Hyde Park is a construct. Buckingham Palace is a construct, and they could have been very different. And so it's very important to see the difference because the constructs of the computer world are the, of the computer world are the furniture, the buildings through which we have to move. We are we are prisoners of the vision of others. Now, the, today's computer world was created at a place called Xerox Palo Alto Research Center or Xerox Park. And genu generally, when you read about them, it will be with the most flowing praise. They've gotten the greatest press in the world. I'm going to change that. Because in my new book, Geeks Bearing Gifts, my <coughs> view is it all went wrong at Xerox Park. Because they created the world of folders and stuff and icons and clipboard and cut and paste. <laughs> and essentially, these were these changed nothing because this was just a mask, just a fig leaf over the original structure of the operating system which had not changed in the slightest. You are still dealing with files. Each file, each document must be in one file. That already limits you. Uh, you have to decide whether to throw the file away as a unit. You can't check through individual changes you might have made. All of these are design decisions made by the team of Xerox at Xerox Park. Bob Taylor, Alan Kay, uh, uh, a host of famous people. Uh, the names don't jump to my mind at this moment. But, uh, and all of them with agendas of their own. And the principal agenda was not, as Alan Kay would claim in his very speeches, to make computers clear to the man on the street. The principal agenda was to make computers clear, to Xerox upper management in Connecticut, who didn't know the slightest about computers and would accept this simplified picture. But they took away so many powers that the user had had before. The user wanted to be a user of Unix in the times before. And Unix essentially defined the computer world, and then Xerox Park cut it down. And I'm saying, let's go back before Unix, challenge some of those conceptions, and start over with a world more suited to what people need. As Fitzgerald wrote in his translation of Rubaiyat, Ah, love, could you and I with him conspire to change the sorry scheme of things entire? Would we not smash it all to bits and then rebuild it to our heart's desire? So, there are still possibilities. I want to show you zigzag, and I brought discs for those of you who want to study it, but maybe we should stop for a discussion. Ted, Ted, one thing for me that comes from senior manipulators, since you're last here as well, is how much, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts about touch screen technology. And of what touch screen, screen technology, T touch, touch screen, screen. Yeah. and moving around yeah. in this program. It's, to me, different 
input and output don't affect the structure. The real issue is the constraints. So if I could change the size of this like this, fine. But it's still a thin contract. Uh, the next machine I would like to put this on, this is on Windows now, and I would say my next priority would be to put it on the iPhone. I just found out yesterday that the iPhone is Unix. I didn't know that, did you know that? Well, I did think I did. Did you know that? Yeah. Okay, the, uh, the Macintosh we've known is, is yeah. Unix, the Darwin version of Unix, but so is the iPhone without, with a different interface. And that means that anything you can do in YouTube, Unix, you can do on an 8 gigabyte iPhone, which is a hell of a lot bigger than the first Unix machines. And, uh, and so, uh, but by the way, the, the next plan for this will be Flash. So this runs in OpenGL. But, uh, but getting, it to, getting a web presence for, for uh, Xanadu space, or Xanadu, will basically take Flash as a client, because that gives us really nice smooth text movement and uh, things you cannot do anywhere else in the web browser. You see, what is the World Wide Web? It's whatever runs in the world in the web browser, and the browser is deliberately restricted for one-way connections. Who made this restriction? Well, who invented the World Wide Web? Everybody says Tim Berners-Lee. Yes, he gave us HTTP and the URL. But who invented the browser? Two kids. Eric Bina and Mark Andreessen were students at the University of Illinois. How old were they? Uh, well, no, Mark no. was an undergraduate, and Bina, whom I haven't met, is, uh, was a graduate student. Okay. And uh, they worked tirelessly for a year or two to create what was then called the Mosaic Browser, but it's more properly called the NCSA browser. And then Mark went west and sold it to Jim Clark, and they started Netscape, where as Larry Smarr licensed it to Spyglass, which licensed it to Microsoft, and thus began the browser wars. But now the standards are maintained by the World, by the World, Wide, World, World Wide Web Consortium under Tim Berners-Lee. So the man who didn't design it is now maintaining it. But enforcing, of course, everything that I think is wrong with the web. <laughs> you can't do anything I want on the web, therefore, except through something like Flash. Discussion with John Lewis? Yeah, well, we'll see you. What's that supposed Any questions? I want to see these rascals. <laughs> yeah. On this, when would, for example, the, the, this new Xanadu space be available? Would it be, for example, on, for download on the internet? I would love to say yesterday. <laughs> and I've learned never to give a time estimate. Because then when, then when uh, it's not met, people reproach it. Because it's always possible to do it in a certain point of time. But if you don't have money and you don't have resources, and sometimes the resources aren't money, it's programmers. Because there's an old saying from um, the book, uh, I'm not remembering it today, The Mythical Man Month. Uh, putting more programmers on the project slows it down. Because A, each one of them has to then learn all the parts of it, of what they're doing, and then communicate with more of the others than they were before. So, having the fewest people you can get away with is the best. We can put soon an editor that would allow you to, the user, to create your own set of... On Windows first. Yeah. yeah. On Windows first. But we're talking, we're talking basically about at least a man here. How many men go into that man here? Yeah. You, you talk about making links two way, but how would you manage the, the aspect of things like, you know, from my experience of links is the internet, and you may have multiple pages linking to one thing. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you manage that? Do you not end up with confusion? You know, you could end up with millions of things linking to one thing. That's, that, that's your editorial judgment in building that topic. But doesn't that tend to centralize the data? And, you know, if, if someone is having to sit there and go, actually, I don't want that linking to there because it's going to make it's going to confuse the issue, then you end up centralizing and say giving someone sole control or a group of people sole control over one document. Well, that's how it is now. If you publish a document, you have sole control. To, to, 
I'd, I'd say to a certain extent, yes, but equally, we, we hear very often about how publishing something to something like the internet loses us control because then it can be taken away. And it, it just, it just doesn't. The one, the, the one you put there stays there, assuming you're, that you're, uh, that nobody is sabotaging your server. Mm -hmm. But yes, people can copy it. Okay. Um, we, we have essentially the same thing. We're talking here about a new document format. Mm -hmm. The document format <clears throat> concept is that whereas the web page is, is, is stupid simple, you've got text with these horrid angle bracket thingies in it that pollute it. <clears throat> and they point, they point outward. Uh, ours is a, a, little, a little richer. You have the content list, which says, bring in this piece, pardon me, a line that says, bring in this piece, and this piece. So, so everything can be made of pieces. And then a flink list, flink or floating link, because everybody thinks a link is what you have in HTML, okay? They say HTML is human readable. You have to either redefine human or readable, or both. <laughs> okay. So, uh, your flake list says, here to here, of the type here, and it's on that part. So this is the left inset, and this is the right inset. Where did where it go? So, you, <clears throat> so these are the links, and these are the content, and the transclusions are discovered because the same part is in more than one list. It's a nice kind of visual medium, and uh, it's a really nice to look at. But in terms of the whole process, if you're starting to link everything together, then you're going to want to have the links with the second document where you get all the information from there, and you're going to end up connecting everything. And so this... I, wait, 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 just a second. Suppose I make a link to the Declaration of Independence. How does that change? I mean, in terms of kind of uh, writing from... this writing this one document, and you're, you're putting all your sources in there. I mean, you're, you're filling up a lot of space. I mean, you're kind of, rather than just having your one document, you've got to have everything you're sourcing it from. No. Where are you getting that from? You ca you're caching the portion that you're bringing in. Oh, okay. But space is very cheap. Human time and thought energy, those are the, expen those are the expensive resources. So the clearing, <coughs> it's, it's worth spending quite a bit of space and time on computer time to make things clearer to the human mind. Yeah. That's, that's, that's right. Uh, yeah. Yes? Uh, I understand what you said about the structure of the document, but how is it actually constructed? Is it in markup language? Again? No, that's it. That's it. It's... It, well, it, well, I mean, some, some, we have a couple of conventions for saying, bring this in, bring this in. In, in the sense of a markup language with angle brackets, no! I hate those things. Markup is done in a parallel as a flow. This is this is this is in opposition to all that crap that's out there. <coughs> I detest it. Aside from that, it's great. <laughs> so explain how markup is done here. Well, this is the markup. You, so you get so you well, okay. First of all, what does markup mean? We tend to forget. <coughs> all this began when John W. Siebold. I just researched this. And you know where we got the expression WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get? It was actually a line from a comedian named Flip Wilson, who dressed up as a woman and said, what you see is what you get. And John W. Siebel was watching television and said, it's, that's it, that's what I want to express. <laughs> and that then became the expression at, at Zero Hour Park. Um, Anyhow, so uh, Siebel was the pioneer in typeset. 
And markup meant at that time that a piece of text would be handed to a typesetter with pencil markings in pink or red or blue saying what font sizes to use or corrections by the author. That was markup, the physical writing on the galleys. A galley, <clears throat> instead of, before pages were laid out, they made galleys where they would typeset the individual lines. These were cast in hot lead, and they would all be lined, they would all be in this very heavy tray. I think galley was probably the length of weight an ordinary man could lift, because you were talking about a great deal of lead being carried around. And so that, that would then be printed. Then the editor would find the errors or make the changes, and then that would go to the typesetter. And, and then the typesetter would take these slugs of type and change the ones he had to change and lay them out on pages. So, in fact, I remember doing that when I was editing a high school paper in, at the age of 15 and, and uh, 16. And my predecessor hadn't understood that if you change something at a be the beginning of a paragraph, the whole paragraph would have to be retypeset at much more expense. So if, I, if some change had to be made, I would put it on the last line of the paragraph, so no, so only one line would have to be reset. This was the kind of thing you had to think about. A little bit. So Siebold then, I believe, invented embedded markup such as this. He was, he was a wonderful guy. I met him on several occasions. And uh, he was a Quaker who, was, who had gotten involved in labor relations, and because he respected everybody so much, the union people and the management people would shout at each other less and come to an agreement more, more rapidly. And that's how he got into the printing business from negotiating printing paper. Uh, uh, so, anyhow, he created this and set up a company in, in the mid 60s for computer typesetting, which was at that time an incredibly radical idea, even though the equipment existed. It's the equipment companies that made these fine dot machines say, oh, someone will set type with them, not realizing that setting type with them was an enormous programming problem. So anyway, so Siebold's ideas were then taken over at Xerox Park, and, and WYSIWYG became the slogan, and then Xerox created the proto Macintosh, which was called the Star, uh, pardon me, first the, uh, the Alto and then the Star, and then finally Xerox couldn't sell it, so they basically invested in Steve Jobs, thinking maybe you can sell this, and Jobs came through. First he made the Lisa computer, and that was a fan too. And then he made the Macintosh, which was a spectacular success. He, uh, he was very strict with his programs. He said, you can't have this, you can't do this, you can't have this. You can only have 128K memory, and you can only have so many lines out. And Burl Smith, one of the designers, told me, but if we hadn't hidden one of those extra lines from Steve Jobs, the Macintosh would never been expanded. <laughs> these, these, these are little things I'm putting in Geek's Bear and Gifts. So, um, so anyway, uh, what was the question? Markup. How markup, markup is done in sanity space. Oh yeah, so, so our markup is not done with angle brackets or embedding. The whole point is that this is a clean list of content. This, if you just, if you just print this out, you will get all of the contents of the document, of the page, concatenated. So of course you won't have any paragraphing, because the paragraphing is done by these. So all of the markings are done from outside by this list of external objects. And this, this I believe, is, you see, it, it makes me ill that they take this perfectly good text inside the, inside the box and stick in those, and jam in those codes that spoil it for any other use. Whereas if they put exactly the same thing outside the box, then you could have multiple ways of marking out the same thing. But that's not the choice that was made. And it wasn't Tim Berners-Lee, it was, uh, I, I think it was Siebold, and it was certainly the people with the uh, language called uh, SGML, which was the predecessor of HTML. Yeah? Uh, which language is this written? The thing you've just seen is written, the, the, the viewer is written in OpenGL, pardon me, in C++ with OpenGL. The data structure is zigzag, and 
almost all the behaviors are in scripts in Python. So it's a hybrid baby. But it, it was an extremely good choice, I think, because the, <coughs> the OpenGL has to run fast as a bandit to do that uh, nice, smooth, it's much smoother on, on better machines, uh, nice, smooth movement. And at the same time, the uh, uh, Python is perfectly good, perfectly adequate for everything else. Python is a very good language. So we're only five more minutes. Uh-oh. I was wondering, you, you, so you saying oh, yeah, this is something that maybe you should start off with at the beginning. And you now as well said, oh, this thing runs smoother on better machines. But you, you would have rather ha heard that at the beginning. Surely, the point is, no one trying to say is that surely, when they first started off with word processing and things like that, they didn't have the power of oh, sure. what you're doing now. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. No, you couldn't have done this. You couldn't have done these effects, but you could have done. Well, I believe you could have done a perfectly good, different rendition. Yeah. But, I, 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 it ticks me off when people say, "Oh, you can't. You couldn't have done this until now." Of course, I could have. It wouldn't have looked this way. Yeah, that's all. But it would have been the same structure. Yeah. When you take everybody's picture. It's such a fun group. <laughs> <laughs> this, believe it or not, I'm just amazed. Is a high-resolution movie camera. <laughs> Any more? It's lunch to overwhelming. Yes, something like that. Um, you're saying that uh, touch game technology, it doesn't matter. It's, it's about kind of what you have there. But you wait, wait, slow, slow down. I didn't get that. You, we were talking uh, earlier about touch screen technology. Touch screen technology? Yes. Oh, I like it. Yeah, this is the question. Do you kind of like it? Do you like, would you like to see it more recently kind of included? Because whilst it may not be important to what you have there, it's going to make things nicer in terms of moving around. And that's what people want to see. People want ease of mobility. I have a different obsession. I want to be able to type with one hand while I walk. And I've wanted that for 45 years. And the, the bozos who sell computers and they don't get how important that would be for a lot of people. Because I would have hundreds of thousands of notes now in digital form that are still on paper because I've had to write while I walk around and drive and so on. But the point is that, uh, that it, to be able to capture these things with one hand, but they don't get it. They just don't get it. Uh, touch, screen is, touch screen is nice, but it's the frosting on the cake. You, you have seen the, the wonderful uh, demo by Jefferson Hand? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's, uh, that's worth, worth, worth looking at. I don't know whether he licensed, I know that Microsoft is supposed to be bringing out a touch screen table and Jefferson Han and, uh, and the Apple uses multi-touch as well, but I don't know if Han invented it or not. And Han has always got his own business. By the way, people talk about, the, like to talk about the, uh, the minority report interface where Steve Jobs gestures and windows open and close. Tom Cruise. I said Steve Jobs. <laughs> 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 okay, so that is the straight, this is the perfectly ordinary park user interface. These are standard windows that would be square, that get bigger and smaller, that, 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 that run applications that aren't connected. That's the standard interface, which I call the GUI, or the park user interface. And all of the uh, minority report interface was, was the GUI with gloves. So people don't see the inner nature behind what they're looking at. They're just too impressed by, the, by, the, by these uh, snazzy little aspects. That's what I'm trying to, that's what I really would like to communicate to you. Being able to look behind what you're seeing. You say, what's the data structure? What's really going on? Who's in control? What can I do? And uh, I mean, everybody's talking now about Web 2.0, these social sites. Well, to me, I see it as cattle pens and, and shoots that we're, that we're being trapped in by, by techies who make up these, uh, okay, you can have three friends over here, but you can have seven recommendations. What is this stuff that they're, they're, they're building these worlds for us to be trapped in? Uh, I, I just don't get it. Yeah? Uh, do you think there's room uh, for improvement beyond Xanadu? Pardon? Obviously, Xanadu is quite a lot better than the usual. Uh, hypersensitivity and stuff, but there's sort of omnidirectional link linking, but do you think it can improve beyond that? Well, of course. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I, I've, uh, I've learned not to tell people about what I'd like to do <laughs> and try to stick with what I can show. 
But what do you think the next direction would be? Uh, audio, video. Uh, because you ought to be able to edit audio or video. I don't know how much audio video editing you've done. Editing a movie is an amazing experience because uh, because you think you know what you're going to do. And it's so much more complicated than you think than you thought. My movie, which is a 30-minute thing called The Epiphany Slope and Furlough. I shot two hours for it, and I thought it would take a couple of hours to edit. It took me a whole summer working weekends. And uh, finally, for one thing, you realize how important these little twists are, and how many choices there are. And I felt so ashamed of myself for years and years and years at how long it took me to edit that. Until I found out that Orson Welles' first film, which was the Introduction to a stage play called Too Much Johnson, which it was going to be the opening 10 minutes, and he was sitting in a hotel room in Connecticut and he never finished. So it's highly misleading how complicated it is. So the way the standard way is you have little little, little shots at the bottom of the screen, okay, and then, then you you move them up and put them in order. But that, that, that doesn't tell you how long it is. It doesn't tell you where it is in the continuity. Whereas what I would do is I would have you represent each reel as a line and say, very much like the same data structure, same data structure, different visualization. Now move this, put this over there. Now put this over there. Okay, so you're <clears throat> you're taking these portions of these uh, of these uh, different film strips or, or reels of video, and rather than just, of course you'll see the shots as well. Of course you can see thumbnails, but you'll be able to see the continuity of their source and the continuity of where they're going, and you ought to be able to do that for editing audio too. Editing audio is quite hard. That's a brilliant uh, demonstration of what you're talking about. It's really, really yeah. well, As I said, we have the data yeah. structure. We just need yeah, yeah. yet another, as they say, jazz mob. Just a small matter of program. <clears throat> um, Ted, could you very briefly, so I, I think this is very interesting, just, just sum up and say something about your copyright idea. You know, really oh, okay, really sure. Really let me tell it the way it occurred to me in 1960. See, I think I saw the problem whole because <clears throat> I, had, uh, I had worked in stage and writing and editing. And I even had my own copyright certificates for a magazine I published my freshman year called Nothing. And I knew people who lived by their writing. So I knew copyright wasn't going to go away. So, on the other hand, I imagined this medium where you would be able to create an anthology of anything at all from anything that's out there. I say, ah, what you do is you just pay for each portion when you get it. You don't buy the book, you buy the paragraph, buy the next paragraph, the next paragraph. Come on, keep going. And paying by in a very small amount for these portions. Now, the publisher is getting proportionately exactly what he'd get for selling you the book, but hasn't sold you the book yet. And so it's completely fair. So I've been working on how to, how to adapt this to the present world. And, he said, and, and, and here are all these guys like Stallman, Richard Stallman, a friend of mine, who created open source and Linux, GNU Linux. Uh, you say, wait a minute, I thought that Linus Torvalds created Linux. No, no. He created the kernel for the Wintel version, for the Intel version of GNU and got all the credit. So anyway, but, but so, so Stallman is against any selling of that. But of course he uses copyright because open source wouldn't work if he didn't have this iron contract of GNU license, which uses copyright. But 
how to marry, how to use this, how to bring forth this system in the world of the web. Uh, I patented a payment system a couple of years ago, which I just sold to a major company, uh, but retained the right to use. And this would allow wrapping a payment system around the URL of a portion of the company. So the idea is that as you buy things, as, as you read things, or you click on a page that has content, you know it's going to cost something. You can find out how much you care, but, but, but ideally it should cost less than epsilon. So you have a signal that it's only, it's, it's less than 3p. Keep it coming. And you get to keep that portion in your cash. And now you've bought that forever and ever. So it's not pay-per-view. It's a way of acquiring a library, and it's, yet it's a way that publishers can get rewarded for their content. Jaron Lanier, Lanier, the creator of today's virtual reality paradigm, he didn't create the term virtual reality. That was created by a French theater director named Antonin Artaud. But, uh, but anyway, he made the notion of 3D very popular. He wrote a big thing early in his career, said everything should be free, and he wrote a thing just recently, said no, I see now that people have to charge for content. Is that, did, did I say it adequately? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>